بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا بالقرآن والذكر الحكيم اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا بما ينفعنا وزدنا علما يكربنا منك برحمتك أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وانت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سهلا اللهم عيذنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيعات عمالنا واصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستكفرك ونتوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم وبعد فقال الإمام حجة الإسلام الغزالي رحمه الله ونفعنا به وبكم So talking about the five uh, or the, the different members of the body that must be that we must be guarding against. We covered the eye, the ear, and now we're gonna go on to the tongue. Yeah? And the reason why I put the, the slide was because and inshallah we'll uh, also look at um, Surat al Hujurat. Which is very much linked to this, um, you know, the diseases of the tongue. So, um, as we study this, we'll we'll also look at that um, surah, inshallah, taala. Um, so, Imam Al Ghazali, rahimahullah, he says, "ثم عليك بحفظ اللسان وضبطه وقيده." Oh, did we already start this all? Yeah. Okay, where else did we get down to? Okay, so just the introduction, really. When yeah, yeah, yeah. so he says, we'll mention five principles come to do with the guarding of the tongue. أَحَدُهَا مَا رَوَى أَبُوْ سَعِيدَ الْخُدْرِي رضي عنه أن ابن آدم إذا أصبح بكرت الأعضاء كلها إلى اللسان وقلنا ننشدك الله نشدك الله نشدك الله أن تستقيم. so it's narrated in one uh, narration that the son of Adam when he wakes up all of the limbs all of the members of the body they turn to the tongue and they say to the tongue we implore you in the name of Allah subhanahu wa taala that you remain straight or you remain upright to the tongue. فَإِنَّكَ إِنْ إِسْتَقَمْتَ إِسْتَقَمْنَا وَإِنْ أَعْوَجَجْتَ أَعْوَجَجْنَا Because if you are straight, then we are straight. And if you are crooked, then we become crooked. So once again, seeing the central role of the tongue. قُلْتُ وَالْمَعْنَ فِيهِ وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمْ أَنَّ النُّطَقَ الْإِلِسَانِ يُوَثِّرُ فِي أَعْضَاءِ الْإِلِسَانِ بِالتَّوْفِيقِ وَالْخُذْلَانِ So he says the meaning is, Allah knows best, that the speech of the tongue affects, has an impact upon all of the other members of the human being. Whether it will be to lead it to tawfiq, and when, or whether it will be to lead it to error and misguidance. يؤكد هذا المعنى ما روي عن مالك بن دينار أنه قال إذا رأيت قصابة في قلبك ووهنا في بدنك وحرمانا في رزقك فاعلم أنك قد تكلمت فيما لا يعنيك He says this is strengthened by one of the sayings from Malik bin Dinar who said when you see a hardness in your heart when you see, when you perceive a hardness in your heart and a weakness in your body and a and that your rizq has become cut off then know that you have said something that does not concern you or you have spoken of matters that do not concern you yeah, in other words you know, an idea here that if you do certain things that may be either displeasing or disliked or even haram, this may affect uh, other areas 
of your life. One of them, uh, you know, I um, can't remember exactly now, uh, when Imam Shafi, you know, when it was either being deprived of Qiyamul Layl, if anyone remembers the story, he, he didn't, you know, he, he, he was deprived of a certain ibadah because he had said, I had glanced at the um, shin of a woman. He lose memory for some time or something like that. Yeah. Of a, of a non-mahram woman. So, you know, they, they used to have an idea that if you do something, then it can impact, you know. If you find you always used to pray Qiyam layl and then for some time you find that you haven't been able to, it may be because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken that blessing away from you, you know. However, we have to be careful at the same time not to become people that become like despairing people. You know, because you do have also a tendency amongst people, like whenever anything any hardship or tribulation happens, they start becoming very despairing and saying, oh Allah is punishing me because I've been bad, I've done this or I've done that. And that's not really how our deen teaches us to be. You know, if you have any tribulation, you lose your rizq, lose your job, um, you know, you have uh, problems in your marriage with your children, etc. It's, it's not, not actually a good, it's not actually from our sunnah to See that all in a negative sense. Like, you know, I must have been bad, I've done something bad. This is being a punish. Actually, as it says in the hadith, the ones that Allah loves the most, He tests the most. You know, He gives the most ibtila, most tribulations. So, um, it doesn't compute, you know, like that. You know, so, it's always good to keep a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you start thinking like that, very negatively, you can start then having also a negative opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Adhan, like he's always punishing you or he wants to punish you. You know, whereas we should have a really good opinion that Allah wants to forgive us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is guiding us and all of these things, you know, we're making tawbah. So on. It's a, it's a fine line, I mean, but it's just to be careful, you know, some people can fall into a very negative way of thinking as well. Um... Whereas, what we should do if any tribulations come upon us is just say, you know, Qadar Allah, ma ala Allah has decreed this, He knows best His wisdom. You know, yes, maybe, you know, may I have, of, of course I have sinned, but inshallah I made tawbah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive me. You know, I have a really good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not to fall into despair, which is what shaitan wants us to do. Remember, and always think of the Prophet and the other Prophets, how much tribulation they had. You know, if you think really, what happened to the Prophet during his life, no matter what happens to us, normally is nothing compared to what happened to him, the things that he went through. And he was the most beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in terms of, you know, one of the most traumatic things that can happen to people, like losing your children, for example, you know. He lost all of his children during his, uh, his own lifetime except for Fatima. Yeah. His three sons that were born all died in their infancy. So these are like the most traumatic things that can happen. In terms of deprivation of rizq, like, you know, they, were, they had harsh sanctions put upon them by the Meccans, the Muslims. You know, like nowadays we have people in Muslim countries or other countries put sanctions on them. And they suffer, you know, because they don't get food, drink, medical, you know, all these things. The Muslims had that in Mecca, you know, to the point where some of the Sahaba said we were eating leaves of trees to try to just, you know. So you imagine that, that level that they must have been of starvation, you know, at that time. So all of these things, you know, they happened to the Prophet Wasallam. So before we start thinking Allah's punishing us, or, you know, we, we're really bad, start despairing. Always think, you know, that, that if Allah loves you, He can test you more as well. You know, so try to keep that good. Try to keep a positive. The Prophet is a very positive person, you yeah? know. And He wanted us to be positive. And even for those people who give da'wah and give khutbah and things like that, you know, they have to be careful always to, to give a positive uh, feeling to the Muslim, you know. We have to give good news to the, to the believers 
and a warning to the disbelievers, you know. Give good news to the believers. Don't make them feel despairing or depressed. Well Athani Hifdu Waqtika. That was the first principle that, that the tongue is the controlling element, you know. I don't know if you mentioned obviously the famous hadith where the Prophet said Rasul Amar al Islam wa umuduhu as salah wa zidwa tu sanami al jihad. The the main affair is Islam. And the pillar of it is the prayer. That's the thing that holds your Islam up. Without the prayer there's no structure. There's no Islam without the five daily prayers. Wa zidwa tu sanami al jihad. The highest peak of it is jihad. In other words, struggling and striving in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all of your uh, resources. That's the highest peak where, you know, the, the, the people of the highest iman, they struggle to achieve to that level. So we start with the salah and then we end with the jihad fi sabilillah. There's nothing higher than the highest peak. Zidwa tu sanami al jihad fi sabilillah. So and then, but then he took hold of his tongue. And he said, well, you know, Kuf, he said, how is restrained this? He said to them, do you know what is the controller, the milak of all of these things? The controller of all of these things, all of these three things. And he took hold of his tongue and he said, Kuf alayka hadha, restrain this, restrain this. So the tongue literally is the controller of our whole deen. It's a very, very, uh, um, very important member of the body that we have to take control of. We have to take control of because they really can ruin us, you know, can really ruin us. Well, Aslu Thani, if the work to give in the Akthar of my to kill them be a lisan, mean Hayri the Krila Hitala, for Allah Akthar, if you go no Zamban, you sell and who while Al Akal Yakun Lagwan, you'll be or be he al Wakat. The second thing he says to, to the second principle here is to just. Be careful of your time. Be careful of how you spend your time that you've been allocated. You know, we've all been allocated a certain time in this world. And we can't increase that time and we can't decrease that time. That time is there. Every day that passes, we're going through that time. And then when it comes to an end, we'll finish. You know, there's nothing we can do. This is the time we have been allocated. So the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, take care of that time. I mean, think about how you're spending that time. Because you only have one chance to spend that time. There's no way you can rewind. It's funny, you know, when you get kids uh, nowadays that are growing up watching TV and these sort of things. They make funny statements like, you know, I remember there was two children that were playing the other day in my house and then he wanted the other one to stop. So I said, pause. <laughs> or something like that. They just used to pressing pause and everything, you know. Um, so he says, you know, be very careful in guarding your tongue because most of what we say when we are not mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, in other words, if we speak and we're not mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're not remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, usually that thing will be something sinful. You know, whether minor or major sin, it will be something sinful that will be asked about on Yom Al-Qiyamah. You know? And sometimes, even if, it, even if it doesn't get to the point of being sinful, it will at the very least be something that is just a wasting our time. It's lahu. Yeah? It's what in Arabic is called lahu. Lahu just means something empty. Yeah? Lagha just means uh, to be empty, basically. And it's mentioned in the Quran that in Jannah uh, they don't hear any lahu. Wala yeah? yeah? One of the attributes, one of the descriptions of Jannah is that you don't hear lahu and you don't hear ta'theem. You don't hear useless, time wasting things. You know? Because it's, it's empty, it's, you know, it's, it's not reality. You know? Looks like the computer has got mind of its own. 
developing consciousness as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> Ominous, you know, when they start doing things themselves. Um, because, you know, Jannah is, is not a place of batil, it's not a place of emptiness, it's not a place of falsehood. It's a place of haq. In this world, the haq and the batil are mixed. Mariam, you have to open that door for her or what, what's going on? Can't she open it? Uh, in this in this world, al haq wal batil are mixed. You know, there's truth and there's falsehood, and which will lead to an interesting state of affairs. You know, you got the worst of people and the best of people mixed. You know, in the next world, it's se completely separated. Al haq wal batil. Mm -hmm. uh, in reality, there is no such thing as batil. In reality. Uh, but batil by its nature just means something that has no reality. You see what I mean? That's why it's contradistinction to haq. Haq is actually true. It's real. In, in Arabic, the word for truth and reality are the same. Al-haq, wal-haqiqa. You know? So batil is just something that has no reality. If I, if I speak a lie, yeah? if I said to you I went to the moon yesterday, yeah? there's actually no reality. It's, 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 just, you know, it's empty, it's batil. There's no worth to it. No? It's no, it's no, so that's why you know the, this concept of haq is very important in our deen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one of his names. Al haq. You know? Everything else is bartered. Let me show let me see which key you got. Omar, do you know which key it is for that? Not these. He's got this. I think it's just a lot of like a paper clip. It doesn't say yeah. on the label on it. Oh, yeah. well, well, what, what about you know when you, you tend to tell children, "Oh, don't do this. Monster's gonna come." Mm. Is, is that um, simple? Yeah, that's an interesting, very good point. Uh, obviously, this is very common with parents, including my own family. You know, this happens a lot. And parents do use these type. They in England they call them white lies or something. You know, for kids. I personally am quite against it. I'm against it. But at the same time, having had four children, I realize the practical realities <laughs> of, <laughs> you know, sometimes... Uh, so, you know, I wouldn't say it's really a sinful Allah Alim. But I personally don't do it. And I really try to avoid it. Because actually that's how children learn to lie. Because as they, they won't know, perhaps that child won't know that he's being lied to, but there may be an older child nearby who's actually witnessing that his parents are lying to that younger child. You know, it's not like a sin or a major sin or anything like that. But you, the, the child is learning how to trick and how to mislead and how to, you know, lie. Um, so I, I personally, I, I don't think it's a good um, way to do things. But I know in practical real life it can be almost impossible to um, raise children without having to resort to that sometimes, you know, when they're having like severe tantrums or you know they're just really insisting on doing something and you know things like that. so yeah, obviously it's very common uh, you know sometimes you hear they just trust in you you always fake with them you yeah, do this yeah. and they you know there's no issue if you start promising things you don't do it mm. because there's something there and they find it's not mm. it's like no like for example the kid's insisting he wants to go to his cousin's house or something the mother might say, no, they, they have to go to school now or something, or they, they, they're busy, which they're not, you know, and that, that's very common, but I, I still wouldn't even do that, yeah. but, because you might think the kid will never find out, but my experience is they do find out at some stage or another, or there may be other kids that are older that know that you're doing that, and so then they will realise, you know, that they're lying, so. But it may, it may like I said, it may be unavoidable, really, in some situations. So. so try to avoid it, but it's not simple. Uh, I, wouldn't, I, I personally don't think it's sinful. I can't see that it's sinful. Um, I don't think it would come under the like, category of lying, if you see what I mean. Yeah. But I think it may be, you know, just maybe if, if at all avoidable, try to think of other ways to handle the situation. Yeah.
Because it's very hard to then tell the child you, shouldn't, you must not lie and things like that, you know. If they, 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 they just turn around and say to you, but you lied to my, <laughs> my so-and-so brother <laughs> when you told him this or that, you know. I know I live, I mean, I've never thought of it as sinful, but I'm, you know, I'm not sure really, to be honest. I mean, maybe ask other, some other people what they think as well. Okay, uh, well, look at that in the Hassan ibn Abi, uh, ibn Abi Sanan, Mara ala ghurfatin, uh, bunyat. فقال منذ كم بنيت هذه؟ It's not that no, it's been no, it's been related that Hassan ibn Abi Sinan, he once passed by a a a house or a an apartment which had been built recently or something, and he asked someone, you know, when was this built? When was it built? ثم أخبر نفسي وقال يا نفسي الغرورة تسلين عما لا يعنيك. He then started reprimanding himself and said to himself, O oh, deluded soul, why do you ask about something that has no concern to you? وَآقَبَهَا بِصَوْمِ سَنَةٍ And as a punishment for his nafs, he fasted for one year continuously. So this just gives an idea of these, these people, how they were. I mean, these are real stories, you know. These are stories that come to us with Isnads. I mean, these, these people were like that in the past, you know, uh, centuries ago. Uh, the very, you know, very pious people, very strict with themselves. That was a level that they used to uh, watch themselves, watch their tongue. You know, really they would not speak unless it was mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or there was some benefit, something rewardable, something that was pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that. You know? Now this can this doesn't mean uh, you have to be uh, rude to people or something like that either, you know. Because, for example, if you meet someone, uh, then to make a sort of just a conversation like "How are you?" or just a, is actually being trying to be friendly, and that's actually something rewardable, because it's pleasing to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to you know have be to be uh, obviously good relations with Muslim brothers, sisters, etc. Um, and also, it doesn't mean you can't, for example. Talk to your wife, or you know people like that. That you know it doesn't have to be um, like in the hadith in Bukhari where the Prophet ﷺ came home and he sat with his wives and he told them a story of uh, you know something from pre-Islamic Arabia. A lot of commentaries written about that particular story, but anyway, uh, the point being, obviously, when he told the story, he would have a lot of wisdom and knowledges and so on in it anyway. Um, but it was just part of you know just speaking to your family, you know. Uh, in that within that is ibadah if you do it with the right intention, you know, that you're doing it for fulfilling your you know obviously the rights of your wife and things like that. So it's all about you know thinking about the, your intentions before you speak, before you say anything, before you make any conversations. It's all about always looking at our own intentions, our own inward uh, things. These people in the past were just on that different level, you know. And these people did exist, you know, they're, they're, these, these were real people who would be completely um, zuhud, you know, from the dunya. They would literally watch every word they speak. So he just asked, you know, when was that, that built? This is the sort of thing we would do all the time. You know, all these new buildings and, you know, how much how much is that worth and where did this come from? And just normal things, but, you know, for him that was quite a big thing that he reprimanded. Because why? Because he was someone who was trying to fill all of his time remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Trying to copy that state of the Prophet sallallahu and the Sahaba. Yeah? So he said, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Where was the benefit in that asking that question or finding out when was that building built? You see what I mean? Hold to fire to Balil Muhtemmin Bianfusihim. The Mamma Ghazali says, I say 
glad tidings to those people who are concerned about their own selves. وَيَا وَيْحَا الْغَافِلِينَ الَّذِينَ جِعَلُوا نَخَلَعُوا الْإِذَارِ And woe to those heedless people who have just let their tongues go unrestrained. وَأَرْخُوا الْعِنَانِ وَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَانِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who helps. وَلَقَدْ صَدَقَ الْقَائِلُ وَأَحْسَنَ بِقَوْلِهِ So then he mentions three lines of poetry. وَاخْتَنِمْ رَقْعَتَيْنِ فِي ظُلْمَةِ اللَّيْلِ إِذَا كُنْتَ خَالِيًا مُسْتَرِيحًا وَإِذَا وَإِذَا مَا حَمَمْتَ بِال بِاللَّغْوِ فِي الْبَاطِلِ فَاجْعَلْ مَكَانَهُ تَسْبِيحًا فَلَزُومُ السَّكُوتِ خَيْرٌ مِّنَ النُّطْقِ وَإِن كُنْتَ فِي الْكَلَامِ فَصِيحًا Anyone English? Got English anyone? Yeah. yeah? Oh. The poem? yeah. What, what did he translate? Oh, yeah, right. Seize two cycles of prayer in the dark of the night. If you're unemployed and comfortably at ease, and if you're not involved in useless chatter, perform it in its stead a glorification. Thus be of Allah. The need for silence is better than speaking, even if you are very eloquent in speech. Yeah, so nice, nice, nice few lines of poetry, just reiterating what, what's been already said. والأصل الثالث حفظ الأعمال الصالحة. The third principle is guarding our right right actions. فإن من لم يصن لسانه وأكثر الكلام يقع لا محالة في غي في غيبة الناس. So just protecting our actions, meaning those prayers we've done, those nafas we've done, those fasts. The sadaqah we've given, the zakat we've given, protecting it from being destroyed. Because when we do sins, you're destroying your good actions, aren't you? The Prophet said, the hasad burns up your good actions, like fire burns wood. So it's so destructive, you know, just hasad. Just having hasad towards people is so destructive. And so that all sins, you know, they, they start then erasing into our good actions. So on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, if our sins are more, then we we will start losing our good actions to balance it out, you know. So he said, you know, someone who doesn't guard his tongue carefully and speaks very excessively, he will always fall into doing some sort of ghibah, some sort of backbiting. كَمَا قِيلَ مَنْ كَثُرَ لَغْتُهُ لَغْتُهُ كَثُرَ سَقْتُهُ as it is said in the saying, whoever is excessive in his clamor, in his in his noisiness, in his talking and so on, uh, he will be excessive in his loss, meaning loss of good actions. So obviously, as you know, the Prophet ﷺ highly recommended sakut and sakat to to remain silent, and he said, remain silent because this. Gears away shaitan. Yeah. So you have two types of people. You have one type of person who is always talking, 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 and you have another type of person who is quite quiet person. And just talks, you know, not not too much when they need to. Be the second type of person. Yeah. It's more safer for us in our deen. Uh, more safer for us in more uh, getting higher levels, closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And better in the Akhirah. And anyone can change. Just because if you're one type of person, don't think you can't become the other type, you can easily change. This is actually what all Tasawwuf is all about, is changing ourselves. You know, this is the the power of uh, this deen as well. That, you know, some people have mentioned very few uh, teachings have that power today. That can totally transform people's personalities. You know, and we see this all the time. When people come into Islam or Muslim, they start practicing. You can and you will change your whole personality, your manners, you know, the way you behave, the way you speak. All of that will change in accordance with the Sunnah of the Prophet So that was the Sunnah of the Prophet He wasn't someone who was talking excessively and, you know, things like that. He was someone who was a serious and silent person, but would talk, obviously. 
And they said, you know, when he used to remain silent, he would sit with his Sahaba and sometimes he would be silent and they would talk amongst themselves. But when he spoke, they would be totally attentive to him and sit so still listening to what he was saying as if birds could perch on their heads. You know, I mean, how still they were like statues when he spoke. Yeah? But then often he would sit and just listen to what they were saying and they would just be talking about their own things. So be from those second type of people and, you know, if you need to change, just change. It's not difficult. And remember, everything that you give up for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will be replaced with something better. Not just in the Akhirah, but in this world as well. Yeah. والغيبة هي سائقة المهلكة للساعات على ما قيل. and he said then backbiting is that that very destructive. he said lightning bolt. You know? the very destructive lightning bolt, which destroys our good actions. as it has been said إن مثلا من يختاب الناس إن مثلا من يختاب الناس يختاب الناس and مثل من نصب من جيقا فهو يرمي به حسناته شرقا وغربا يمينا وشمالا the similitude or the metaphor of the one who backbites people is like the one who has set up a catapult and he is firing his good actions away to the right and the left all his good actions that's how destructive it is upon our good actions as you know, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned about, you know, he was asked about the lady who fasts every day and she prays every night. But her neighbors are not safe from her tongue. And he said, he has in the, she's in the fire. You see what I mean? This is where, these are all coming from those bases of our uh, revelation, you know. She was fasting every day, praying every night. Yeah? But she was backbiting her neighbors. Slandering them back, but she's in the fire. These, her, her actions are just being thrown away. Those good actions, all those good actions. It's very important, you know. It's very important how we deal with our, our human beings that we live with. You know, as I say, حقوق ibad, the rights of people are more important for us to be careful of. More, much more important. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need our ibadat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need, we can't harm him in any way. But we can harm other people. Yeah? We can't harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if you didn't pray for your whole life, you didn't fast any Ramadan, you're not going to harm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not going to decrease from his sovereignty or his kingdom. You can't harm him, but you can harm our fellow neighbors, Muslims, non-Muslims, human beings. We can do major damage to them. You know, as they say, the wound of the tongue is greater than the wound of the hand. You know, much greater. You, know, you hit someone, you know, it might hurt them, they'll get over it, you know, within probably a few, few couple of minutes. If you hit someone with your tongue, it's something very destructive that could wound them for years. You know, could wound them for years. وبلغنا عن الحسن أنه قيل له يا عبا سعيد إن فلانا اختابك اختابك It was said to Al-Hasan al-Basri رحمه الله The leading by, by most people consider, to be, consider him to be the uh, leading scholar of the Tabi'i This generation of the Sahaba Al-Hasan al-Basri It was said to him Oh Abba Sa'id So and so has backbited you yeah, So and so has backbited you فَبَعَثَ إِلَيْهِ بِتَبَقٍ فِيهِ رَطُبٍ What Hassan al-Basri did, he sent to that person a tray of fresh ripe dates. وَقَالَ بَلَغَنْ يَنَّكَ أَهْدَيْتَ إِلَيَّ حَسَنَاتِكَ And he said with the message that I have heard that you have 
gifted me some of your good actions. And I wanted to return the favor. <laughs> it's like the other story that Sheikh Hamza mentioned about the, the, the man, someone came to him and said, someone came to him and said, oh, you know, so-and-so is saying this about you and that about you. And he said to the man, couldn't Shaitan find anyone else to bring this news to me? <laughs> yeah? Because that, that is in itself is Namima. Bringing that news about people is Namima. You know, we'll talk about it later. Namima is, doesn't mean you're lying. I mean, Namima just means you're simply taking news from one place to another with the sort of intention of facade. You're creating, disrupting people. You know? uh, but often, you know, you may be making out that you're doing it for a good reason or good intention. Yeah? So you go to someone and say, oh, you, you know, don't so-and-so, they were talking about you, they're saying this about you, you don't realize they don't like you, or they, they, they say these things about you behind your back. But you're the one who's namam in that case. You're the one who's actually uh, taking the story from one place to the next. Happened once to my wife, um, someone she knew, uh, that was working in a place where she was working, uh, a relative of hers came to her and said, you know, in the workplace there was so-and-so, a couple of people, they, they're saying these things, you know, they said this about you and everything. And my wife was telling me that those people are saying this about her, you know, and how angry she is about it, uh, and that so-and-so told her this. And I said to her, don't you realize that the person who told you this has actually done a worse sin than those two people in the first place? Because you know? the person who's come and told you this, you think that's your friend who's helping you, but actually that's Namima, that is Namima. You know? Why? Because with these type of things create really bad feelings between people, they create discord, <coughs> they create fitna, they create you know, our society to start then having disputes and quarrels and fights. Those two people may have said something, but they didn't intend for that person to hear it, you know, for whatever reason. And when they saw them face to face, they might have been nice to each other. You see what I mean? But it's caused that bad feeling now. You know? That's why it's called Namima. So could you not take that as a positive thing if someone is saying that in the feedback that you know, maybe there is something that you have said something or maybe there is not a right feeling and it gives you an opportunity to get, get better? But I suppose it depends if on it's done in that way, then it's okay. Yeah. If it's done in that way, then it will be different probably. But, you know, most majority of cases doesn't normally happen like that. <laughs> but if they they really genuinely, they just wanted, they just thought, yeah, there's some bad feeling between these people. I really need to, you know, I want them to be good buddies. I want us all to be good buddies. Uh, yeah, maybe that could be different, but that's not normally the case, you know. Um, like making up between people is so important in the deen, you know. That it's one of the few occasions when you're allowed to lie. You know, so you see why Namima is so bad because it's doing the opposite. Instead of making up between people, you're actually yeah. disrupting. You know, our Dean has got these built-in things that really uh, may enhance society, make society strong. You know, make the social order strong, you know, the Muslim social order strong. All these things are built into our Dean. It starts with the nuclear family, so the, the extreme importance of uh, obeying parents. You know? That's one of the highest, biggest major sins, is uh, rebelliousness to parents. You know? Being um, disrespectful to parents, or kukul walidain. That's one of the greatest kabair. Why? Because that's the core family. And then one of the greatest obligations after that is to your blood relatives. You know? Severing ties of blood relatives is one of the major sins. So you see how you know, that, the social structure is strengthened. There's nothing in Islam that tells you you have to obey your parents. I don't, I don't agree with that. There's everything in Islam tells you have to obey your parents. No, not obedience. Yeah. They have to be good to them. But obedience is conditional. Obedience is conditional only that they don't that you they don't ask you to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. Um I, I think I know what he's maybe alluding to, things like where parents dicta start dictating everything. 
in the person's life, even though they're adults, but they, they don't want to dictate everything, you know. I think probably he's talking about at that level, yeah. you know. That's, that's a bit different as well. But generally speaking, you know. Because if you take that to the logical conclusion, like say you have to obey them, then there would be no distinction with your bar level, not bar level, and so on. Yeah, yeah. No, but there's many examples, even to the point, um, probably not appropriate here, but one of the examples but, um, where uh, not only in the hadith, Obeying the mother three times and then the father was was on the fourth time, and then that was a sohbah, isn't it? Not yeah. not obeying, but sohbah companionship. Companionship, and then if there was anyone you could do sujud to, it would have, uh, in another it's a weak narration, it would have been your mother, if if it was sujud was permissible, and and then there was the narration I know is about the wife to the husband. I don't know if that's a different yeah. narration you're talking about. And, and and there was another instance where the Prophet Sallam correct me if I'm wrong where. He said, make sure you look after your parents, this is where Sahaba's parents were still non-Muslim, and they still had it. Oh yeah, of course, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. The rights of the parents are huge, I mean, they're well known. So I say, I say, yeah. I say that in the context that you're saying that sometimes, if it's conditional, that instance, you know straight away that the parents are not on the hook. So but yet, the Prophet still commended them to be respectful to them and dutiful. No, I don't doubt that, oh, it's just okay. the issue of like, everything they say you have to do. But then I, I guess by extension, can't you just apply that to your leader? Like, I, you can't rebel against the leader, but as soon as he stops you from um, performing your salah, if you can't then make um, uh, a hijra, then obviously you got that dispensation to rebel against him if he smashes you. I think, I think we're, we're talking at the level of um, things like, for example, I'm an adult now. Say my parents said to me, you must send your children to... The, the, the state school instead of the FISA school. Would it become obligatory for me to obey them there? And I think that's probably that sort of level that Faraz Rabani is talking about, that, you know, when you're an adult, you do obviously, they can't just, you know, control your whole life. Hello, Alim, but, but I think that's it's what I suspect. Is, yeah. on you, uh, to maybe explain it to them and maybe discuss it with them. Of course, yeah, them, yeah, that's, yeah. Right. that's true, yeah, yeah. I think they may be a good thing, what, what the parents are saying. You haven't spent that life. You have, they have a lot of experience and they've gone through a lot of uh, uh, situation and circumstances. They're aware of it that you're not. That's true, yeah, so, yeah definitely. So, you know, by discussing it, and, and, and I think reasonable parents will then come to, you know, discuss it and, mm -hmm. and agree to a father which, which is uh, acceptable to both of you. But just because most of the kids do say, we know better than the parents, as they, as they, as they sort of grow up in 14, 15, 16, you know, they, you know, you try to tell them and say, well, I know better. I know better. Yeah. And then two years later, they change their mind. They come back to the same point that you, you've been asking them. So, so I think, uh, you think with teenagers, if you tell them to do something, most times they will do that reaction. Yeah, yeah. if you try and advise them, it's been a nice thing. Yeah. I mean, in the books of Fiqh, it definitely does say, Ta'atul Walidain, Wajiba, you know? You've seen that in the books of Fiqh, including the, not just the father, but the mother as well. Yeah. So that says it, but he may be, I think he may be alluding to whether there's a basis in the actual yes, that's what you're saying. text, you know, that, that where did the Fuqaha bring that. So it would be interesting to um, look in some of the Mutawalat, you know, the, the longer texts, what see how they explain that? that. Where did we come across it? It's in the Lubab, and uh, uh, I remember reading it, you know. When in our Sunday classes, um, I'll look it up, inshallah. I'll look it up. I think I should be able to find it if you put Ta'atul Walidain and Wajib. If you've got good, hopefully, we've got good search engines now. And uh, <laughs> those, uh, <laughs> uh, inshallah, it'll be interesting to look into that. I think, I think there is, there is, um, because you see, there, there, are, there is a culture where in some, in some cultures, uh, children are expected to obey the parents to such an extent, even when they're quite older. Um, the parents are very much dictating everything, you know, which profession you go into, where you live, what you do, probably who you marry, you know, everything. I mean, in my personal experience, I find it much, much stronger in people who are not practicing, mm. but they're Muslim, and they're, there it's like almost absolute obedience. Yeah. yeah. Whereas the religion, I think there's a bit more flexibility. Yeah. People are, no, no, no. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's that. Yeah. I, I think it might be from where you come from and things like that as well. Oh, you know, your culture. Backside, I don't know. Yeah. But 
you know, in this, there's definitely in Islam this very strong obligation of, of not being disobedient or rebellious. Um, so that implies sort of conversely then you have to be obedient, don't you? You see what I mean? Akukul walidain literally means to be rebellious or disobedient to parents. And it's one of the biggest of the kabair. So I would suggest that that implies you have to obey them then. But, you know, to, to what, exactly to what details, you know, I think in the society of the Sahaba, I think they probably took it for granted. When you're an adult, there's certain things obviously you decide for yourself. Um, it's interesting, Umar told his son to live with his wife, and he did. Yeah. But then That's he was saying not Umar as well, wasn't he, though? So. Anyhow, but the interesting question there was, was it wajib for him to do that or not? That's or was not it just advice? I'm just interested you know? in the, the legal side. Yeah. That's that would be a good, good thing to look into. Yeah, good thing to look into. But yeah, so anyway, the point is that these things are built into our deen, you know, uh, obedience to parents, not severing ties of blood relations is the next level, you know. So we have to keep our extended family structures intact. Very strong obligation in Islam to do that. And then it goes to the rights of neighbours. You see, all these things are there to make the social order robust. So these come into that, Nami, Maghiba, these are things that start disrupting. You see what I mean? I mean, uh, the fiqh books definitely say you have obedience to parents is wajib because they actually mention hatta wa al um. You know, they actually specifically mention not just the father and the mother as well. You know, in case some people it's just the father, like being the emir of the house or something. Like that. Or maybe, I mean, maybe they assume there it means below baluk when they say that. <laughs> Al-Aslu al khamis Oh, sorry. Wazukirat al ghiba to Inda ibn al-Mubarak. Backbiting was mentioned in the presence of ibn al-Mubarak. Rahmullah, one of the great um, muhaddith of the early salaf. فقال لو كنت مختاب لا لا أختبت أمي فإنها أحق بحسناتي. Very strange statement saying, if I was someone who backbited, I would backbite my mother. And why? Because she's the she's the one who most deserved my good actions. You see what I mean? وَذُوِلَ أَنَّهُ فَاتَ حَاتَ مِنَ الْأَصَامِ الْلَيْلَةَ الْقِيَامِ لَيْلَةَ الْقِيَامِ فَعَيَّرَتْهُ زَوْجَتُهُ Once it happened that حَاتِمْ الْأَصَامِ One of the great Zuhad uh, of the early period One day he, he did not wake up for Qiyam al-Layl And his wife had a sort of go at him and His wife had a go at him sort of Putting him down and everything. Oh, you're supposed to be a big wali. Look at you. You didn't even wake up. فقال إن أقواما صلوا بالليل البارحة فلما أصبحوا نالوا مني فدقوا صلاتهم يوم القيامة في ميزاني. When he woke up, he said, uh, in the presence of his wife, he said, last night some people they prayed during the night, uh, but then they then they, you, know, uh, you could say, then they sort of, um, then they had a go at me or something like that. So their prayer on the Day of Judgment will be in my scale. In other words, he was just teaching his wife, look, you've done a good thing, you prayed at night, but then by doing that thing, you've now given me your hasanat probably. You know? So it's just a diplomatic way of having got his wife. <laughs> <laughs> Very diplomatic. You <laughs> mention her directly, you know, some people, 
Pinpoint. There's a good good lessons to be learned here for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Third person says. Yeah. He used the word here slander. In so, in which one? The, oh, someone slandered me. Yes. Nalu Minni here. Well, aslu rabi asalamu tu min afat dunya. So the fourth, um, the fourth principle uh, that we want to save ourselves from the uh, the afflictions of the world by guarding our tongue, we save ourselves from the afflictions of the world. Alama qala Sufiya la tatakallamu bi lisanika ma tukassiru bihi asnanuka. لا تتكلم بلسانك ما تكسر به أسنانك. Do not speak with your tongue that which will break your teeth. How do they translate it? Is that what you're saying? Do not utter with your tongue what will cause your teeth to break. Yeah. Yeah, that's another. That could mean that as well. Yeah. I mean, the way I read it was more like that, that translation, which was, you're saying words that are so destructive. Like, so, so metaphorically, you could yes. shan't break your teeth with them, you know. But it could be, yeah, if someone heard it, <laughs> they could come and break your teeth as well. So, metaphorically like that. And probably, maybe it is that, Allah Ali. Which, who translated your one? Uh, I think it's translated to Uthman. Oh, right. Your one is Muhtahol, and he's normally quite good. So, Allah Ali. وقال آخر لا تبسطن لسانك فيفسد عليك شأنك. Another person said, do not extend your tongue so much that it destroys your reputation or destroys your whole affair. وأنشدوا احفظ لسانك لا لا تقول فتبتلى إن البلاء موكل بالمنطقي. Anyone translate that? Anyone got that one? Uh, safeguard your tongue and do not speak, or you will be afflicted. Affliction is guaranteed as a consequence of speech. But that idea sometimes that if we backbite or do these things, it will come back, come back to us in this dunya. Yeah. ibn al Mubarak Allah. Allah yahfuz lisana ka inna lisana. سريع إلى المرء في قتله وإن اللسان دليل الفؤاد يدل الرجال على عقله عقله. You you must safeguard your tongue for the tongue is quick to kill the man its target. The tongue is also the guide of the heart, guiding men to its understanding. Yeah. So, also the second part of it is talking about that the tongue is the dalil of your heart. So, what utters on our tongue is manifesting what's in our hearts. You see what I mean? When you see people who talk foul, uh, destructive, backbiting, lying all the time, this is reflecting what's in their hearts. You know? If you see people that talk good, they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they speak, they don't descend into, you know, foulness and um, cursing, you know, these type of things, insulting. Then it reflects what's in their hearts, the purity of their hearts. It, it, uh, it's sarcasm. I mean, that's what one thing, that being sarcastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's you, not good to be excessively so. You know you're taking, you're taking advantage of the other person, but they don't realise. Oh, yeah, in that sense it could be negative then. Well, sarcasm, if it was done for humour, oh, I thought you meant, you know, just to be humorous. That could be just, you know, neutral. Mm-hmm. But to do that excessively would then just, you know, it's just sort of like, it's misleading in a way, isn't it, that type of thing, isn't it? So it wouldn't be good to do it excessively, but just, you know. Mm-hmm. Some people, it's like English people are a bit like that, aren't they? They make sarcastic comments sometimes. But if it was, if it was done intentionally to hurt someone, then, then that could be definitely... Could go into being sinful as well. What about the case of some people that like they use a lot of street language, just the way they've been brought up? Mm. 
Often it comes out quite crude. Yeah, that's okay. I mean, as long as you don't like swearing, like yeah. insults, you know, things like that. Swearing is, is swearing. Is, you know, you, you shouldn't swear and things like that. Mm. Um, they might be mentioned later on some of the things, you know. But, but if it's just, you know, it's just sort of rough language, that's, that's it reminds me of the, you know the way the Bedouins used to talk. Yeah. That that time. Yeah. That's okay. No problem with that. وَلِبْنِ well, مُتِيعِ لِسَانُ الْمَرْءِ لَيْثٌ فِي كَمِينٍ إِذَا خَلَى عَلَيْهِ لَهُ إِغَارَهُ فَصِنْهُ عَنِ الْخِنَابِ لِجَامِ صَمْتٍ يَكُونْ لَكَ مِنْ بَلِيَّاتٍ سَتَارَهُ A man's tongue is like a lion in a den. If he sets it loose, he'll attack him. So restrain it from obscenity with the bridle of silence, for then you will have protection from your afflictions. وفي المصري السائل رب كلمة تقول لصاحبها دعني. How did they, how did they translate that word? Uh, according to the popular refrain, many a word says to its owner, "Leave me." We shall ask Allah for assistance through His mercy. Oh, I haven't got that last bit. That's probably why. Yeah. So that was um. That was a popular. That was a saying of the Arabs. Ruba kalima tahuni sahibiha dani. It's as if the words that you're about to utter are saying to you, "Don't do this," you know, because they're so bad. You know. Um, let's check in the toilet. I was wondering if we should go to Hajarat so we finish this and then do Hajarat next week. Maybe have a look at sort of Hajarat, that might be better. We'll carry on with this, I guess. Yeah, finish the film. Al Aslul Khamis, Vikru, Afat al Akhra, Wa Aqiba Tiha. Wa Askuru Fihi, Nukatahu, 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 Wahida. This is the fifth principle. Uh, with regard to restraining the tongue, is to remember, remember always the tribulations of the next life and the ending that we're going to have. This is is one of the most powerful ways, you know, to start restraining our tongues and going into obedience of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Is to always remember where we're going to end up. Like the Prophet said, "Aksiru dhikrakum." Uh, Hadim and love that, you know. Remember very much the destroyer of pleasures, so death. So remember it very much, in other words, you know. That should be one of our dhikr, you know. Reflecting, thinking about it. And if that is done at the same time with a type of struggle of ibadat and purifying ourselves, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then, you know, guide you. And give you the openings of that, you know, remembrance of death. So he says, I'm just going to mention one point in this respect. This is look, I'm just going to mention one thing. Firstly, that whenever you speak. If you're not speaking good, if you're not speaking dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, either it will be something that is got contains something which is haram and forbidden, or it is a speech which is permissible, but it's of a wasteful nature, of no consequence, of no relevance, of no usefulness. You know, an example of that would be, you know, who won the match yesterday? Oh yeah, Liverpool won 4-0. Okay, is something of no use, no consequence, not something haram, you know, but it's of no use, no consequence, no, unless you're actually in, in that, you're, you know, you, you work in that industry or something, that might be different because it's part of your work, but apart from that, then... So please don't think I'm uh, in any way claiming to be on this level of never mentioning anything like this, you know. This is just like, um, these are the highest ideals, you know, to go to that level of dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, 
we live in a time where if we stick to our just farad, that will be a huge... Yeah. Anyone in this time who stays away from uh, major sins and sticks to their farad, they will become wali. There's no doubt about it, you know, in this time. If you don't do any major sins, and you stick to those things which are obligatory, you will be a wali. Because of the time, nature of the times that we live in. That's right, yeah, Sahih, yeah. So we're living in that time, you know, so... I mean, these are the highest ideals, but of course we should strive, you know, we should try to limit our um, time when we just speaking wastefully and occupy our time with the of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, this is the the, the, the the tragedy of the age we live in. You see people who are involved in spiritual movements, tariqa movements, etc., who are spending time doing nafals, nafal practices like zikrs and wirds and all of these things, but are also at the same time doing things which are haram, major sins. You know, like backbiting or harming people and all of these things. There's no point in that at all. You know, there's no point in that at all. It's not going to help in any way. In fact, it may then be just become a way to become misguided within that practice. You know? The first steps we need to take are to stop from these things, major sins, do what things which are found upon us first. You know? Not to say people shouldn't do those things as well, but it's when you start doing those things, but then don't have a concern about those other more important things. That's the problem. I'm also, also, I'm not trying to say you must stop all that first and then start doing those nafas. No. Start doing those extra nafas and thicker and so on. But then that should become a means of stopping those things. You know? Like it says in the Quran that the salat and hanil fahshai wal munkar. We start the prayer. The prayer should then prevent us from doing major sins. If it's a sincere prayer, you know. It must impact on that. What, what has changed that we, we consider... As a end, like that it means to an end. Yeah. Everybody just that's it. I've done salat. I've done my job. Yeah. It leads to an end, which is a Definitely. Yeah. The salah in itself, if you if you're harming people, backbiting people, you know, these things, cheating, it's not going to be useful. You know, it, it has to impact on that. Those. You know, I've mentioned several times that the, the hadith when Ibn Abbas anhu, he was seen one day breaking his atakaf and leaving the masjid when he was in atakaf. You know, and his companion asked him, Why, what, what's going on? And he said, I heard there's one of my Muslim brother who needs some help with some debts or something like that, financial difficulties. So I'm going to help him. You know? Then he mentioned what the Prophet told him. You know, I can't remember the exact words of it now. But that was much more rewardable to do, go and help a Muslim in need, than to stay in the masjid day and night doing the attic you know? These are the type of things we have to reorientate ourselves. You know, the deen, for, for a lot of people, the tragedy is the deen has just become like a cultural practice. You know, I'm talking about young people now as well. You know, young people in these countries, uh, it's just become another type of, uh, you know, way of, uh, just certain practices they're doing, you know. But the actual real essence of Islam is not there. The real essence of Islam is the Muslim should not harm those around him. You know, he has to be one who rectifies people around him. And that if he can't rectify, he does not harm those around him. That's what Muslim is. 
the first surahs that came down in the Quran, they weren't uh, telling people to pay zakat or go for hajj or some Ramadan. The first surahs were saying that Amul Masaki. Uh, you don't you don't try to uh, help each other to go and feed the poor yeah? uh, the, the, the orphans take care of the orphans you know because in, in Arab society because of the tribal society an orphan who had no fam you know parents a father to protect him and give him that thing often they would be the weakest and they would be taken advantage of, their wealth would be just taken off them, you know. So that's what the Quran was, the first surah that were coming in Mecca, was saying these things. I mean, the, they, were, they were giving the core principles of the new deen to the Sahaba. Later on, then, you know, some Ramadan, Hajj, all these things came in. So this, this, is, where people, this is where people need to be reorientated, you know. فَإِنْ كَانَ مَحْذُورًا فَفِيهِ عَذَابُ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى الَّذِي لَا تَعْقَةَ لَقَ بِهِ So says, these are two things. One, either you're saying something haram, or, say, or the other one, you're saying something which is uh, permitted, but it's a waste of time. As for that thing which is haram, then this is linked to the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which you do not have the ability to bear. فَقَدْ رَوَيْنَا عَنَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ أَنَّهُ قَالْ لَيْلَةَ أُسْرِيَ بِي رَأَيْتُ فِي النَّارِ قَوْمًا يَأْكُلُونَ الْجِيَفِ The Prophet ﷺ said, on the night when I was taken on the Isra, the journey to Jerusalem, I saw in the hellfire a people that were eating dead bodies, corpses. فَقُلْتُ يَا جِبْرِيلُ مَنْ هَؤُلَىٰ I asked Jibreel, who are these? قَالَ هَؤُلَىٰ إِلَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ لَحُومَ النَّاسِ These are the people who eat the flesh of people, meaning backbiters. So, as you know, this is mentioned in the in the Quran in Surah Al-Hujurat, which inshallah we'll look at next week. Uh, I've got GF, which makes more sense. GF, you know, dead bodies. Because yeah. Haif, GF, same letters, isn't it? But just the, the dot behind. And the, so, I think GF is probably correct. Allah Alim. Someone, if someone has time, they could look up the actual hadith and find out. But I'm pretty sure it says GF. I'm not sure 100%. Um, so you see the Quran mentions that, that, that image. You know, that image is in the Quran of eating the dead body of your brother. That's a very powerful uh, in the Quran. It's uh, Surah al hujurat We'll look at that next week. When talking about backbiting. So you can see in the Akhirah, this becomes actual reality. You know? The meanings become manifested in the Akhirah. As some of the scholars mention, in this world, um, the, um, the forms or the, the forms predominate, but in the Akhirah, the meanings uh, predominate. You know, the meanings. So we, the meanings actually manifest like physical realities. You know, like for example, in many hadiths, it's mentioned these things, like on Yom Al Qiyamah, those people who were reciters of Baqarah and Ali Imran, meaning either they memorized them or they, uh, there's different interpretation. Either they memorize them or they used to recite them very regularly. Those surahs will come like they will manifest as clouds above them to shade them, you know, from the torturous heat. And things like that, so many hadiths, you know, so the, the, these meanings will become manifested. It's also, anyway. وَلَقَدْ قَالَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ لِلْمُعَاذِ اِقْتَى لِسَانَكَ عَنْ حَمَلَةِ الْقُرْآنِ وَتُلَّابِ الْعِلَمِ اِقْتَى لِسَانَكَ عَنْ حَمَلَةِ الْقُرْآنِ وَتُلَّابِ الْعِلَمِ وَلَا تُمَّزِّقِ النَّاسَ بِلِسَانِكَ it's narrated that the Prophet ﷺ said to Mu'adh ibn Jabal, anhu, Stop your tongue. Stop your tongue from the 
uh, from the people of Quran and the seekers of knowledge. In other words, stop your tongue from harming those people who are Hamalat al Quran, Hufaz of Quran, you know, the Hufaz of Quran and the Tulab al Ilm, meaning the people who seek knowledge, the students of knowledge. And by obviously, by uh, priority, the actual people of knowledge, the ulama as well. Why? Because these, this is the most dangerous people to backbite. These are the most dangerous people to backbite. In, in Syria, they have a, they have a saying, al ulama masmuma. The flesh of the ulama is poisoned, poisonous. You know? Because when we backbite, we're eating the flesh of the dead brother. But when we backbite the ulama, we're eating poison, it's even more dangerous. Uh, and this hadith also indicates the same idea. Why? Because you don't know which of those people is wali. Even with any Muslim, you have the same danger. But with these people like Hafiz of Quran, the Alim, the Shaykh, the Tulab al Ilam, these people are actually people who are in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're people who are sacrificing their lives, you know. For getting the knowledge of the deen or for memorizing the Quran, they're doing that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're going to be very, very dangerous if you harm these people with your tongue. You're in a very dangerous position. And this is a big, big fitna amongst the Muslims, you know, in our society. In certain circles that you will go to, you know, certain circles you'll sit in. You will find, I mean, this obviously amongst practicing people, you'll find a, a great uh, amount of talking about other shiyukh, other ulama. You know, a great amount of criticism. Now this is extremely dangerous. You know, If it's on the level of criticizing their, uh, like their ideologies or their teachings, or their opinions, in a sort of a, an academic or a sort of... Um, in yeah, an academic type of fashion, that's fine. You know, so-and-so Sheikh, sheikh says that, uh, you know, for example, in London, there's a particular Sheikh who says that every time you leave your house to, to go to anywhere, shops or anything, you become Musafir. And you have to shorten your prayer and all of these things. Now, obviously, that's ridiculous. No, you know, it doesn't make sense in any way from Naqal or Aqal, you know. But there is this person saying this, and people follow him, and people actually implement what he says in, in London. You give me a genuine example. Yeah. This is a genuine oh, example. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is a genuine example, because my, my, one of my wife's best friends, she's involved with this um, so-called sheikh. So this is ridiculous. But, so if we talk about that, we say, oh, no, he says this, but according to the Quran, the hadith, it doesn't make sense. This is fine, this type of discussion. You know. But there's a fine line between... When people start actually criticizing them for their, the people, you know, their own, it becomes personal, as they say. You know, the attacks start becoming personal. And this is very dangerous, I, I would say. Very, very dangerous. You know? I would really recommend people not to sit in those gatherings at all, you know, just... Because you never know these people, you know, they're, they're people who have... who may be very close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't know. Don't take the risk. Because man li waliyan faqad aathantuhu bilhaq. Whoever harms one of my people, I declare war on him. Now you do not want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to declare war on you. you know, we don't want that. We have to be extremely careful. Don't go anywhere near that type of uh, scenario or situation. And, and that, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk, talks about that in the Quran, declaring war, is that in this life or in the Akira or in both? Well, it's in the it's in the present tense. Well, it's it's not in the present tense, but uh, it's in the context of being immediate. Yeah, it doesn't mean it's in the past tense. So, in other words, you know, it happens right now. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. from there, what do we deduce? Tribulation in the form of just tribulation being put forward to you, or what? Well, it's it's you know, if Allah declares war on you. I mean, I haven't got much chance. <laughs> Put it that way. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who controls everything about your life, you know, your reserve. Anything that happens is in his command, so um, you can interpret it doesn't you don't need to interpret that, it's obvious the meaning of that, you know. Yeah? 
So that's why, you know, just, you know, if you are going to talk about people, you have, okay, it's better to talk about these rulers and like some people do, you know, politics. You know, these people are really are tyrants and things like that, you know. Um, George Bush or whoever you want to talk about. But, you know, don't, there's no point talking about ulama or shayuk. You know, it's really dangerous. And, and then the Prophet, in the Hadith, it carries on. And do not tear up people with your tongue. Do not, you know, destroy people with your tongue. Because you will then be torn up or destroyed by the dogs of the hellfire. By the dogs of the hellfire. وَنَ بِقِلَابَ قَالْ إِنَّ فِي الْغِيبَةِ جَرَابُ الْقَلْبِ مِنَ الْهُدَى خراب القلب سوري إن في الغيبة خراب القلب من الهدى. One of the one of the people of Allah said, in backbiting is the the destruction of the heart from guidance. You know the deviation of the heart from guidance. فنسأل الله العصمة من ذلك بفضله. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to protect us from that through His generosity. هذا في الكلام المحذور وما المباح في أربع أمور. He says this is to do with that, 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 those things which are actually completely forbidden type of speech. As for those which are permissible but wasteful, he says four, four matters. أَحَدُهَا شُغُلَ الْكِرَامَ الْكَاتِبِينَ بِمَا لَا خَيْرَ فِيهِ وَلَا فَائِدَ If you're talking things which have no benefit, you know, wasteful things, you are wasting the energy, not the energy, but you're wasting, you're preoccupied in the angels that are recording your deeds with things that are just emptiness and wastefulness. You know, they have to write all these things down that you're blabbing on about. <laughs> it's, a it's an interesting one he comes with, you know. You wouldn't really think of that, isn't it? You're just wasting their time, they have to write all this stuff down. وَحَقُّ لِلْمَرْءِ أَنْ يَسْتَحِي مِنْهُمَا فَلَا يُؤْذِيهِمَا For a man, this is to do with مَرُوءَ, something that we've lost, you know. They had this idea, you know, someone who's a real man, you know, who has maru'a, he should at least be a bit embarrassed why he's wasting the time of those angels talking this nonsense, you know. قَالَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ مَا يَلْفِذُ مِنْ قَوْلٍ إِلَّا لَدَيْهِ رَقِيبٌ عَتِيدٌ It says in the Quran, he does not speak any word except with him. There is the raqib atid, these very watchful uh, people, these angels, you know. وَثَانِي إِرْسَالُ كِتَابِ اللَّهِ لَا إِرْسَالُ كِتَابٍ إِلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى مِنَ اللَّهُ وَالْحَذَرِ Secondly, you know that everything you say and do, all your actions, are going to be presented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? So once again, do you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be receiving all of this nonsense that you've been doing? Yeah? فَلْيَحْذُرَ الْعَبْدِ مِنْ ذَلِكِ وَلْيَخْشَ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ So you should be, be even wary of that as well. You know, we want what, what, is, what is presented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you want it to be the best things, you know. وَذُكِرَ أَنَّ بَعْضَهُمْ نَظَرَ إِلَى رَجُلِ يَتَكَمَلُ بِالْخِنَى It is mentioned that one of the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said he was listening to someone who was talking obscenities. This is what we're talking about, obscene, you know, like swearing or just obscene, obscene stuff, you know, like probably of obscene nature that we, not, not, not uh, respectable people don't talk about these things. He said to him, look, you, what you're doing, you're, you're actually dictating a book that is going to be presented to your Lord. You know, everything we say is going to be written down and presented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So be careful what you're dictating. If we try to bear in mind everything we say is like we're actually dictating a book. You know, we'll see that book ourselves as well. You know? It's a very, very, uh, very interesting way of looking at things, you know. And so you can see he's put khina amongst those things which are actually mubah. He's put in that section. So, you know, Obscenity, you know, it's not like a major sin probably, some of it, you know. 
maybe for example, just talking about things, you know, not respectable um, items of discussion. But it's it's not the it's not the it's not the feature of someone who does dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that tongue he's using for dhikr, he's using it then for these obscenities as well. It's swearing and these things, you know, it's quite distasteful to do that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Obviously, you know, you know the culture we live in, it's just norm- normative. All these things swearing even amongst so called upper class people and all of that, you know. وثالث قراءته بين يدي الملك الجبار يوم القيامة. And thirdly, don't forget you're going to meet this book that you're dictating on the day of judgment in front of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. ألا رؤوس الأشهاد. There'll be witnesses present at that time. بَيْنَ الشَّدَائِدْ وَالْأَهْوَالِ One to, and at that time you'll be in such a state of, you know, hardships and tribulations and punishments and all of these things, and that's the last thing you want to see, is your book full of these obscenities and, you know, things, wasteful things. وَن تَجِيعًا أَتْشَانْ عَرْيَانْ You'll be hungry, thirsty, naked. مُنْقَتِعًا عَنِ الْجَنَّةِ مَحْبُوسًا عَنِ النِّعَمَ You know? At that time you'll be being led away from Jannah and the pleasures and you'll be wishing why is my book full of these type of nonsense and wasteful things and obscenities. And fourthly, related to the previous points, um, you know, just using your time with these wasteful matters, obscenities, um, you're going to reprimand yourself and you're going to feel regret for these things. Yeah? And, and, and seeing this in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will lead to embarrassment and shame. Yeah, and some, as someone said, beware of these wasteful matters, wasteful speech, wasteful acts. Because the, 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 the reckoning for that will be lengthy. You know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes us to reckoning for all of our deeds and our speeches, do you really want to have that in your book at that time? وَكَفَى بِهَذِي الْأَسُولُ وَاعِذًا لِمَنْ إِتَّعَذَى He says, these principles are enough of a warning and enough of a reminder for those who take reminder. وَقَدْ بَسَطَنَا فِي كِتَابِ أَسْرَارِ مُعَامَلَةِ الدِّينِ مَا فِيهِ مُقْنَعِ He says, you know, for people who want to have more uh, detail about these matters, they can go to our book, أَسْرَارِ مُعَامَلَةِ الدِّينِ فَانْظُرْ فِيهِ تَجِدْ الشِّفَاءِ Look there, you will find a lot of healing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to act upon those things which we read. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to practice those things which we preach. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq to purify ourselves and become people that He loves and they love Him. And He's pleased with them and they are pleased with Him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the tribulations and fitan of the time we live in. Just Allah wa anna Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ahu ahlu. جزا الله عنا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ما هو أهله جزا الله عنا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ما هو أهله سبحان ربك رب العزة عما سفون وسلام على المرسلين الحمد لله رب العالمين Please stay for some tea إن شاء الله